it's Candy from The Candy Show, and I'm here with my reading wrap-up for July and August. At the end of July, I was at home in New Brunswick with my family. Denise and I took our first two weeks off in eight years. It was amazing. We haven't had a vacation in that long. For new viewers, Denise is my wife, and I'm originally from northern New Brunswick, where my huge family still lives, and that's where we went. So I couldn't I couldn't tape what I had re read in July at that point, so I thought I'd put the two months together. If you watched my June wrap-up, you know that this summer I was all up in the books that had summer in the title. I just couldn't get enough of them. Um, this was one of the ones that I read in July. It's The Summer That Melted Everything by Tiffany McDaniel. This was a hard one for me to tell you if I liked it or hated it. Um, I think an editor should have put a little bit of reins on her quote-unquote creative writing like in the first I want to say two chapters it was so the clouds today were like flour on the counter after someone's made bread on a humid day uh, like it, everything was like so ridiculously um, just too many adjectives too much trying to be artsy in the descriptor when that stuff comes naturally the way it does to say like a Sherman Alexi and it just drips every now and then it's amazing when someone is working really hard at that it just it was it was I kept laughing and reading this stuff out loud to Denise um, the premise of the story was set in 1986 in a small town called breathed not not no sorry breathed breathed because at one point she explains how the how it's called, and it's basically breathed. Um, her the main character's father is a um, prosecutor, and he invites the devil to their town. He puts an ad in the paper inviting the devil to breathed. At no point from the beginning to the end do you ever find out why he invited the devil, what any of that was about, really the devil showed up in the form of a young uh homeless black boy in overalls which i had to keep saying like 90 86 right this was supposed to be in 86 because she said it and she made uh the young black boy like as if it was to kill a mockingbird it just like if you are black or brown i would suggest that this book might offend you um she did shine a light on a lot of the racism that was taking place in the town but I, I don't know, start to finish it. But here's the thing. It was like a car wreck. I couldn't not finish it. I was like, well, I, got, I have to see how this resolves. In the end, I didn't really feel that it did resolve. Uh, so I think I give it a two out of five on Goodreads. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't recommend it. The summer that melted everything. Not, not a good one for me. Now this I kind of knew was going to be a hit because it's Judy Bloom, And when does Judy Bloom ever miss? It's certainly not... Uh, Pulitzer Prize kind of writing, but it is certainly fun summer writing. This is called The Summer Sisters by Judy Bloom. It was a really fun ride of two young girls who weren't, in fact, sisters. They were uh, very close friends, but they were like sisters because they spent all their summers together. Two very different personalities, and they would go in the summer to one of the friends' homes, and the book really follows them through the arc of their life meeting boys there's a little bit of for other lesbians out there there's a little bit of girl on girl action at the very beginning um, but it comes it brings them right through to adulthood and it was an interesting look at the strains that are placed upon uh, friendships that last through for a long time it's funny it's um, when I think about my relationships with women uh, friends when I say relationships I mean friends People that you were friends with for a short time, it's it's usually for the most part sunny and bright. People that your friendship stretches out over decades, particularly if it started when you were very young, those friendships tend to take a lot of hills and valleys and if they last, the good ones, um, it goes through a lot of apologizing to one another and kind of changing to suit how each of you are growing differently and I just felt that this book I've had probably um, I want to say three maybe three relationships like that 
throughout my life, one of whom isn't my friend anymore, uh, two of whom remain friends to me. Um, and this book really got me thinking about them and about those friendships, so I really enjoyed it and I would highly recommend it as a great summer read. Now if you recall back in January I had made some lofty reading goals for the year in terms of getting some classics read. That has kind of gone off, uh, the, the wheels have come off the wagon. Um, doing Canada Reads in January set my reading back because I had to so concentrate on those five books. Uh, actually not in January, in March. So for the first three months of the year I was concentrating on those three books. It got my reading behind, so there were two things I was going to do this year. It was that list of classics that I had mentioned, and then also I was trying to follow the Paper and Glam book club. I'm reading a little bit from each, but it's not going to be a fait accompli at the end of the year, just to let you know. But this was from that list of mine. This is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. This actual physical book, you'll see there's still a marker in it because this is two books in one. This also includes Three Guineas, which I am going to read probably this month. Uh, but I read uh, A Room of One's Own in July and absolutely loved it. Both of these books, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, were two speeches that Virginia Woolf gave and then she later added to them and made them into books. And the concept behind A Room of One's Own is this idea or notion that to really make good creative writing, to put out good fiction, that a woman needs a solid income so that she's not worried about her roof or where her meals are coming from um, and she needs a room of her own in order to work in where she can be uninterrupted and she she is a woman who came from means so there's a certain amount of privilege that comes in the way she's writing in terms of what's required but I thought it was really interesting the way she really looked at some of the women writers of her time and for some of them suggested that yeah had this woman had more means financially and uh, more privacy to write you know she talked about Jane Austen having to write in her parlor where there where there were people and hide her writing underneath like letters or whatever to make it look like she was just writing letters so that people wouldn't realize she was sitting there writing a book and she talked about how amazing Jane Austen was, but she also uh, wondered at, hmm, now had Jane been free to write and had a private room to do it in, how much more amazing could the writing have been? So it's, it's just a very interesting look at what it takes as a woman uh, to create. And I think you don't have to be a writer to be interested in it. I think if there's any kind of creative endeavor that you're interested in, this is an interesting look at what it takes for a woman to really cut that out in life and um, as a person who's just signed a book deal and is in the throes of writing a book myself I would have to agree that uninterrupted space I mean you you get the you know you hear about Maya Angelou having gone to hotels and just kind of barricaded herself in for weeks to write and I can see why that's necessary because when there's another person in your space or your pets or the television or whatever um, all of those things sort of tend to interrupt when the flow gets going so it's just it's really an interesting look and when you think about when it was written and I think so many women today are still struggling for that 50 pounds or 500 pounds a year or whatever it was she suggested and uh, and a nice quiet space of, of her own to write in very interesting and as I said this month I'm going to read three guineas and I'll let you know in the um, September wrap-up how that goes. Uh, this one was kind of a little bit of smut for me. It was uh, Mystic Summer by Hannah McKinnon uh, who's apparently author of The Lake Season. This is not the kind of book I would normally read. Again I had just done this sweep of all books that had summer in the title. It was good though. I like I enjoyed it. It's a scenario a lot of women are going to recognize, particularly straight women. Um, you're in your 20s and a lot of your girlfriends are getting the jobs of their dreams and they're marrying quote unquote the man of their dreams and you, if you're the main character in this book, have just lost your teaching position. You're, you're Romance is on rocky ground and she ends up returning home to her folks place. She goes specifically for a friend's wedding but then ends up staying, meets an old love of course um, that she went out with in high school or at the beginning of university. <coughs> Excuse me, so from about 
the fourth page, you know exactly what's going to happen. You know how the whole thing's going to play out. You know, you know who she's going to end up with. So very light, very predictable. Um, if you're into that kind of book, it was light. Now this book came from the Paper and Glam uh, Reading Club. It's a memoir called Love Warrior by Glennon Doyle Melton. And I wasn't sure what I was going to think of this because I was a little worried going in that it was going to, particularly after hearing Lisa Marie talk about it, I was thinking, Ugh, is this going to be an Eat, Pray, Love? Because no offense to the gazillion people who loved Eat, Pray, Love, but I thought that was like the most privileged book ever. Like how nice for you that when your relationship falls apart, you have the money to travel to India and, and Italy and France. Um, you know, most women are just picking up the pieces and trying to keep a roof over their heads after a relationship breaks up. So I was worried this was going to be like that. It absolutely wasn't. This uh, memoir really was inspiring for me because as I was reading it, I was saying to Denise, this is what I would like my memoir to be. Um, because I didn't have a lot in common with this woman, yet this book seemed so universal to me. It seemed... Um, it just seemed like there was so much there that um, that really talked to me as a woman. Ironically and comically, I, I had this book sitting on my nightstand for ages before I realized that this heart right here, that's a woman <laughs> on, that, on that side of the heart. And I just never noticed it until like very close to the end of the book. <clears throat> Excuse me. Glennon um, has a struggle with alcoholism and um, a lot of self-doubt. She does, on some level, kind of find God, um, but I don't think you have to be a religious person to get into this. She ends up in a marriage that's not quite working, but it's very interesting to see that through therapy, both that her husband went to and that she went to, they found a way to, A, first of all, decide whether this relationship was worth saving and then the steps they took to get to a place where she could feel fulfilled and as a whole human being within the relationship. And I think whether you're gay or straight, whether you're single or in a relationship now, I think for most women you would find this book interesting in terms of uh, watching how this particular woman with her particular set of circumstances got to a place where she now feels like a whole human being and her relationship is working. Because I think so often when we are in a string of bad relationships, it's not necessarily about the relationship. It's that we haven't done what we need to do for us and we're trying to do something for someone else and it just it doesn't work right like you have to really know and love yourself before you can know and love someone else and I thought in this small book it's not it's not a it's not a big uh, precious she's not going on and on she's not feeling sorry for herself she's just saying here's what happened to me here's how I got from this place where I was completely unworthy where my body was only used by other people my you know lovers children, whatever, to a place where I owned my body, I used it for myself, um, and therefore was able to have an emotionally fulfilling relationship. Um, I'm, I'm stunned. It has the Oprah sticker on it, which made me like, eh, is it going to be good or bad? I'm a big Oprah fan, but sometimes I didn't like the books that she uh, chose to back. But this I would highly, highly recommend. Love Warrior by Glennon Doyle Melton. I'm in fact going to look for her other book because apparently she has another one out. I don't know. Yeah, it says uh, Carry On Warrior is uh, the name of her other book. I'm going to check that out. I really enjoyed it. Now, if you follow Canada Reads, you know last year I defended Katerina Vermette's The Break and the theme of last year's um, Canada Reads was the book that all Canadians need to read now. I have just been sent an advanced copy of a book that's coming out at the end of September here in Canada. And I have to say, it has become the new book that I am going to champion for 2017-2018 that I think all Canadians should read. It is Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death, and Hard Truths in a Northern City by Tanya Talaga. This book, Tanya is a uh, reporter for the Toronto Star here in Toronto, Canada. She has won multiple journalism awards over the years. Uh, she's been sort of at the center of a number of key investigations 
into indigenous issues here in Canada. And she started work on this book, I'm not even sure how long ago, but she was chasing down a different story when she found herself in Thunder Bay speaking to a man whose son had died. And through that conversation, the story of these seven students who all had to travel from like northern communities to come down to Thunder Bay in order to go to school um, and then ended up dead sort of came to light and what what I love about how she handled this is if you're someone who knows nothing about indigenous issues she gives you enough background so before it's funny in the first I'm gonna be honest in the first page or second page I was a little worried she was describing this community and, and she got very um, like this is where white people with Kias who go to box stores on Saturday like that one paragraph I was like oh no is this gonna be some weird like creative writing um, I just I can't I'm, I can't quite articulate what I mean but I did it, it made me feel like uh oh I don't think I'm gonna like this but quickly that dissipated and the kind of writing that I'm used to reading from Tanya in terms of her journalism showed itself and she gives you the background of why these communities are where they are why they're broken up the way they're broken up why they have to leave there to go to school um, in Thunder Bay she gives you a history of residential school and then lets you see that that has not ended that indigenous people are still if they want their kids to have high school because education is so bad in so many of our particularly our remote communities that they have to travel down to cities and how in this particular case in Thunder Bay Ontario Canada a number of those students end up dead and she felt that the student stories were important um, she had this beautiful thing at the very end where you find out why she named the book uh, Seven Fallen Feathers and it's just an incredible heartbreaking ride through reality of what's happening not in the past not she you know she mentions Cheney Wenjack who is the young boy who died in running from a residential school 50 years ago it was made very popular last year when Gord Downey from the Tragically Hip uh, put out a book and an album around it but no she's telling stories of what's happening right now here today and the overall feeling that I was left with on this book when I was younger and more naive I used to say I believe the problem is that Canadians don't know if Canadians understood what was happening to indigenous people right now they would not stand for it they would stand beside us and protest on the streets and I believe that there was a point in here where former Supreme Court Justice Yakabuchi is touring some of these communities and he says Canadians must not know. If they knew, they would never stand aside and let this happen. And what I think is wonderful about the way she weaves this story is she very gently in a non-accusatory way is saying now in 2017 Canadians do know and yet it's still happening nobody's standing on the street corners I shouldn't say nobody but certainly the country on mass is not demanding a solution to what is happening with indigenous people and particularly with indigenous youth um, it's just incredibly well researched well documented again this is just the advent reading copy so I didn't get to see uh, the epilogue that was still to come so when the book drops that'll be in that nor could I read the notes but she does put suggested reading at the back which I thought was great because there's been such a debate here in Canada about what is what is authentic indigenous writing and what isn't <clears throat> you can google that if you haven't been following that in the media but I just think it's really helpful that Tanya included a list of suggested reading if when you're done this you say okay I need to know more about this so that I can get active about it Seven Fallen Feathers by Tanya Talaga it's supposed to come out uh, in September in Canada November in the US so American uh, viewers you can get this too and that's it that is what I was reading in July and August got a few books on the go right now I have to tell you I finally started 
Gone with the Wind. Oh boy, I'm struggling. I think it's really well written. Um, I'm not struggling that way, but it is the Deep South in the middle of slavery. And the language used around um, black people is mortifyingly painful. And even reference to my people, there's a couple of references to indigenous people, also mortifying. I have to keep telling myself that's the, that's the time and place that this book is about because I do want to read it. Um, but boy, that is a challenge. But more about that when I give you my September wrap up. This video is already pretty long because it's two months together. So I am going to wrap it there. You can follow me on Goodreads if you want to see how my challenge is going for the year or what I'm currently reading. Um, and always come back here, click the subscription button so you don't miss any of my reviews on what I'm reading or what products I've used up or what I'm loving lately in terms of uh, beauty and skin preparations. All right, thanks so much for watching. I'm Candy from The Candy Show.